Kenobi. Hello there. Welcome back, Screen Crush. I'm Ryan Airy, and oh man, I am excited about the Obi-Wan Kenobi series. Here are all the Easter eggs, references, and little things that you might have missed in the first trailer for the new Obi-Wan show. We open on the sands of Tatooine, where Ben Kenobi spent his years in exile between the trilogies. Now, there's a lot of symbolic meaning to desert sands and ruins. Now, these sands call to mind biblical locations like Babylon, Israel, and ancient Egypt, places where ancient civilizations flourished, were destroyed, and then rebuilt, just as the Jedi Order was destroyed and is being rebuilt. Built. Desert Sands also call to mind works like Percy Shelley's Ozymandias, where all that remains of a once great kingdom are two broken legs of a statue and a plaque that reads, Look on my works, ye mighty and despair. Why are you talking about the Bible and Percy Shelley and stuff? This is about Star Wars. Well, because, Doug, Star Wars isn't about just what's happening, it's about how it makes us feel. Star Wars draws from ancient mythology and cultural references. So, when people see these sands blowing on a rock, we subconsciously think about all those ancient lands, like we're all archaeologists uncovering the ancient truths of Obi-Wan Kenobi. I see. I love you. <laughs> I love you too. Then the camera rack focuses and we see Obi-Wan riding his Eopi, the same beast of burden that he was riding at the end of Revenge of the Sith. Now you probably recognize the music right here. That is from the moment where Obi-Wan Kenobi was first revealed in A New Hope. <laughs> In fact, John Williams is returning to Star Wars to score this series. Kenzie L on Twitter points out that the music that opened the trailer is a modified theme of the Battle of Heroes. That was the duel between Anakin and Obi-Wan in Revenge of the Sith. This is showing that that duel is still echoing in Obi-Wan's mind. Then we see him walking the streets of a Tatooine city. Now. I doubt this is Mos Eisley. That's actually pretty far from the Lars homestead where Luke grew up. Look, I can take you as far as Anchorhead. You can get a transport there to Mos Eisley or wherever you're going. Also, Ben feels the need to explain Mos Eisley to Luke when he's a teenager. Mos Eisley's spaceport. You will never find a more wretched hive of scum and villainy. It implies that it wasn't that close to home and he didn't go there very often. The city is also way too small to be Mos Espa. That's the city from Phantom Menace and Book of Boba Fett. So I think this is most likely Anchorhead, the town closest to the Lars homestead. This is also the location of Power Converters R Us, otherwise known as Tashi Station. So this sickly space pony off to the side here is a rare species in Star Wars. It's your mom. It looks like Obi-Wan is working as a stone cutter. <laughs> Now, later in the trailer, we see a transport bringing people into this town. I'm guessing this is some kind of company transport bringing in all the people who work in the outskirts to their jobs in the community, which is a pretty common thing that companies do in rural areas. You can even see a line of people shuffling by them like their shift has just ended. Now, we saw similar makeshift tent workplaces on another desert world, Jakku in The Force Awakens. Next, we see Obi-Wan riding home across the Dune Sea as his narration intones. The fight is done. We lost. Now, I'm very curious who he's talking to here. I have many theories, but I'm going to go into plot speculation and theories down at the end of the video. I just freaking love Star Wars, you guys. This show is going to be so special because it unites two trilogies, which have a lot of meaning to two different sets of fans. So in a way, the show is going to unite two different parts of Star Wars fandom. I mean, Star Wars is so important and personal for everyone. Everybody remembers their first Star Wars experience. It's one of those experiences that fans will treasure forever. We all have special moments like that that we want to remember. For instance, I had this made. This is a star map of exactly how the stars were aligned at the exact moment that my wife and I met. Aww. And it was made by Underlucky Stars. They're the sponsor of this video. Underlucky Stars creates personalized star maps showing the unique alignment of stars in a place and time chosen by you. This is a great gift to remember an important moment in your life. All you have to do is enter the time and location, and they create a print of the sky. This shows the constellations and locations of all the stars, showing you how they were aligned at your special moment. It's a very cool, personalized gift. You can choose from more than 15 designs, choose your commemoration message, and the title. It's also very durable and will last for generations. But how do they know what the stars look like on that day? Well, Doug, Underlucky Stars has proprietary methods of locating stars that have been verified by NASA astrophysicists to ensure their accuracy. This also makes for a great surprise gift. We love this map. Every time we look at it, we remember how lucky we are to know each other, and it's a sweet reminder of how it all began. They also support and fundraise for the International Dark Sky Association, which is dedicated to limiting light pollution and space litter, so we can all actually see the stars in the sky. So, Underlucky Stars is offering Screen Crush viewers an exclusive 10% discount on any order with the code Screen Crush. Go to underluckystars.com slash Screen Crush to get your star map now. Back to Obi-Wan. 
He's sitting at the entrance of a cave. In the just released Entertainment Weekly first look photos, they show Obi-Wan in a similar cave, and they call this his new home. So apparently, Obi-Wan originally lived within sight of the Lars homestead to keep a better eye on Luke. Now, this guy face on Twitter points out that this shot mirrors the first time we saw Obi-Wan in A New Hope. Now, in the comics, Owen does warn Obi-Wan to leave his family alone. So after the events of this series, Owen probably warns Obi-Wan to get away from his family, causing him to move out to the Dune Sea, where he would be out of sight, but not out of force range. A long time have I watched. Then we see Lil Luke Skywalker, as always, dreaming about being someplace else. Never his mind on where he was. Hmm? what he was doing. Now we saw Luke playing with his toy starship in A New Hope, and here we see him fantasizing about being a pilot, or maybe even about being a pod racer. It's even possible that Luke heard about his father, Anakin Skywalker, the great pod racer from Tatooine. Now Owen would definitely know that Anakin was a pod racer, so he would have forbidden Luke from ever trying the sport. He has too much of his father in him. That's what I'm afraid of. We also saw Obi-Wan keeping an eye on Luke in the terrific episode of Rebels, The Twin Sons of Tatooine. You'll notice that the goggles readout is also very similar to the model that Luke used in A New Hope. And then, oh, this happens. That is the incredible prequel theme, Duel of the Fates, introduced when Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon dueled Darth Maul. We hear this as the Lucasfilm logo blows into sand. Much like the great works of Ozymandias. Good, you're learning. Then we cut to this Sith ship, which at first looks like we're looking at the top of Fortress Vader on Mustafar. Very cool that the Sith incorporated those design elements into their ship. I like the ships, but can they have pointy ends like the top of Vader's house? I mean, I don't want to be the bad guy here, but it's more aesthetically pleasing if everything has a united theme. We all agreed on black. Then we see this is actually a Fortress of the Sith Inquisitors on a water planet. Now, in case you don't know who the Sith Inquisitors are, here's a little bit of a primer. They are servants of the Sith who are force sensitive and can use lightsabers, but they're not full-fledged Sith. See, there can only be two Sith at a time, like Yoda said. Always two there are, a master and an apprentice. Now the reason for this is because the Sith will always be in a power struggle for dominance, and this struggle actually led them to almost destroy themselves in a Sith war centuries before. So the Jedi hierarchy is like a flat round table, like the Jedi Council, where everybody has an equal voice. But the Sith hierarchy is a pyramid where only one person can be on top, and at the bottom we have the Sith Inquisitors. They first appeared in the Knights of the Old Republic video game, but those stories are no longer considered canon. They're still awesome though. The Inquisitors were reinvented for the show Star Wars Rebels, but they've also been key players in the comics and video games. After Palpatine declared the Galactic Empire, the Inquisitors assisted Darth Vader in wiping out the Jedi Order. A young Jedi named Darth Vader helped the Empire hunt down and destroy the Jedi Knights. Now there are quite a few canon stories that take place between the prequels and original trilogy. There's novels, comics, and the shows Bad Batch and Star Wars Rebels. And the Sith Inquisitors are present in a lot of these stories, in particular Star Wars Rebels. That show follows a small rebel cell that includes a former Padawan, Kanan Jarrus, and his Padawan, Ezra Bridger. The two of them eventually fought and killed the Grand Inquisitor. There are some things far more frightening than death. So you might be wondering, where did all these Inquisitors come from? Well, different places. For instance, the Grand Inquisitor was a guard at the Jedi Temple. He's actually one of the guards who arrested Barriss Afi in this scene. He had an axe to grind against the Jedi, and so Palpatine recruited him. And it's speculated that some of the Inquisitors were raised from birth by Palpatine. In the Clone Wars and Rebels, we do see Palpatine try to acquire the Jedi's records of Force-sensitive kids, and Cad Bane even kidnaps some of the babies on behalf of Darth Sidious. The Inquisitors are also numbered, so far up to 10, I think? So this guy, called the Tenth Brother, was once a Jedi Knight named Mira Luca Prosset Dibs, and he first appeared in a prequel comic about Mace Windu, back when he was still a Jedi. There's also the Fifth Brother and Seventh sister who were charged with hunting down the killers of the Grand Inquisitor. Your capture will please Lord Vader. And the eighth brother was given the job of hunting down Darth Maul, who survived his having in the Phantom Menace and became a crime lord thrice over. There was also the sixth brother who was killed by Ahsoka Tano in the novel Ahsoka. Then she took his red kyber crystals and purified them, turning them white. And these are the same crystals that she uses in her white sabers that we saw in Rebels and in The Mandalorian. <laughs> But the most tragic Inquisitor was the second sister, a former Padawan named Trilla Suduri. She was taken from her master and brainwashed to hate the Jedi. 
She's an exceptional character who hunted down Cal Kestis and Jedi Fallen Order. And there have been a couple other Inquisitors mentioned over the years as background characters in the Darth Vader comics, but those are the major ones so far. In the time period when Obi-Wan is set, it's most likely that all these Inquisitors are alive. And in the Entertainment Weekly still, we see Reva on Tatooine talking to Owen Lars. My guess is she's looking for an old hermit named Kenobi. Obi-Wan Kenobi. I wonder if he means old Ben Kenobi. He really should have changed his last name. This is Fortress Inquisitorius on planet Nur. It's the headquarters of the Sith Inquisitors that we saw in Jedi Fallen Order. I believe it's the same fortress here that was released in the concept art last year. That could be where they keep Jedi prisoners, like the Raft and the MCU. Maybe, but in Rebels, Kanan Jarrus already confirmed that the Jedi prisoners were sent to Mustafar. I've only heard that name once, from Kanan. He said Mustafar is where Jedi go to die. And then we hear the voice of the Grand Inquisitor. This patience. Now in Rebels, he was voiced by the great Jason Isaacs. I'll deal with you later. But here he's played by Rupert Friend, who I'm sure is a great actor, but it would have been cool to see Jason Isaacs in this role. Tell me about Ohio. Then we see the Grand Inquisitor in what looks like a restaurant on Tatooine. Of course, we've seen outdoor dining like this in Tatooine before. Chuba. This shot is also our first look at two other Sith Inquisitors. This appears to be the fifth brother who we saw in Rebels. And on the other side, just here, is a new character named Reva, played by Moses Ingram. Now, I'm just going to guess something here. Because she looks like a normal person and she's pretty, I think she's going to turn on the other Inquisitors and help Obi-Wan fake his death. The Grand Inquisitor has an insignia on his chest that I, I think is new. It looks like a modified version of the Sith Eternal symbol that we saw in The Rise of Skywalker. Then there's this voice. The key to hunting Jedi. Now, this could be Rupert Friend as the Grand Inquisitor, but it also sounds an awful lot like Emperor Palpatine. His patience. Patience. So we might be getting a cameo from Ian McDermott in this show as well. Somehow Palpatine returned. The Emperor is dead! Dark science. Cloning. Secrets only the Sith knew. Then we see the Sith Inquisitor meeting room in their fortress. Notice the same sickly green skies just outside the window. Now I'm very curious about this chair with the tall pointy spikes like the top of Fortress Vader on Mustafar. Could this be where Lord Vader sits when he comes to visit the Inquisitors? We would be honored if you would join us. Now we do have confirmation that Hayden Christensen is reprising his role as Darth Vader in this show and that they will duel once more. Have another swing at each other. It might be quite uh, satisfying for everybody. Now notice this Sith Inquisitor with the tendrils in the back of her head. First I thought she could be the Seventh Sister, but they're not the same species. The Seventh Sister doesn't have these head tails and the front of their uniforms don't match. Santiago Orkin on Twitter pointed out that she is a Thalothian just like the young Link Katuni in one of my favorite Clone Wars episodes, The Gathering. Now, it is very possible that the Sith took in several Padawans and younglings and then turned them to the dark side to become Sith Inquisitors. And boy, bad guys in Star Wars sure do spend a lot of time in board meetings, don't they? So then we see that the Sith have been hanging people in the town square. Now, it's very likely that they have somehow learned that a Jedi is hiding near this town. Either they learned this through the Force or, more likely, Obi-Wan helped someone out using the Force and then they were like, oh, there's a Jedi here. Word got out. There's also real life parallels to the Holocaust. Nazi officers combed the countryside for Jews who were in hiding with the assistance of their soldiers nicknamed Nazi stormtroopers. Now here we have officers who dress in black, just like the SS, assisted by stormtrooper soldiers trying to hunt down members of a religious order who have been scapegoated by the authorities and are persecuted for their beliefs. Oh, so this is why they were bringing up Israel earlier. Exactly. Now, Reva addresses the crowd, and we see Joel Edgerton reprising his prequel role as Uncle Owen. Now, he's got the long hair and scraggly beard that he's going to sport later in life. Now, I've talked about this in a past video, but Owen is one of the most important, underrated characters in Star Wars. He protected Luke like he was his own son, and he raised him to be the man he is. So, for better or worse, Uncle Owen raised the Jedi. You should really check out that video. It's quite good. Next, we see Reva on a new planet called Dayu. Now, writer Joby Harold told Entertainment Weekly that this planet sort of has a Hong Kong feel to it. It's got a graffiti-ridden nightlife and is kind of edgy. And this is also cool because series showrunner Deborah Chow's father is Chinese, so she's taking the show back to her own roots. The Arabesh letters on the roof spell out ER, so this could be a hospital. And there are Arabesh letters all over this planet, most of which are hard to see clearly enough to translate. But here they spell out milk, maybe a cheeky reference to the blue milk of Tatooine. Stop 
whining Lugan. Come have some blue milk. Next, we see the Sith shuttle landing on Tatooine, followed by a shot of an Imperial walking along a planet that's probably not Tatooine. Why not? Because I can see a shrubbery. <laughs> Calm down. Sorry. Now, as for this officer, this actor is Indira Varmer. IMDB lists her character's name as Tia. Now, there is a Tia Mirabelle in Star Wars. She was a Jedi Master and Archivist of the Jedi Order during the High Republic. So, that was hundreds of years ago, so this is obviously not her. But I am wondering if this could be a Jedi dressed as an Imperial. Later in the trailer, we see Reva facing down someone with a very similar pistol. And I know, that pistol also looks like Han Solo's. And I think actually this show does take place around the same time as that movie. So you never know, this could be Han or maybe even Beckett before he did this. These letters seem to spell out Haas Market. Haas is the last name for several Star Wars characters, implying that this is the name of the proprietor of this market and not a shop that sells you big farm hands you shouldn't let near rabbits. So then we see this stormtrooper talking to a droid. Now the droid looks similar to a Separatist tactical droid like we saw in Attack of the Clones or a KX security droid. Taking us to the quiet. quiet. And there's a fresh one if you mouth off again. The arabesque on its chest reads Ned, so I'm gonna guess that his name is Ned. Now the stormtrooper he's talking to is wearing very battered armor and they're careful to show a close-up of a mallet in their hand. Or maybe this is a carpet tucker, since now we all know what that is. I'm wondering if this stormtrooper is actually Obi-Wan wearing his tattered old Clone Wars armor but in disguise with a stormtrooper helmet that he took off one of the soldiers. Then there's a shot of Reva force jumping across rooftops, probably part of the same shootout that we see later in the trailer. More on that in a second. Then this very interesting shot of the Grand Inquisitor using his signature spinning saber to intimidate a bald man. Could this bald man be a former clone trooper like Rex from the Clone Wars and Rebels? After all, we saw that he had his control chip removed and he stayed a friend of the Jedi Order. Now, in the Bad Batch, he's even seen forming a kind of resistance, maybe linking together different Jedi cells. I mean, look, a Rex cameo played by Tamura Morrison would be very cool, but it looks like this guy had like cybernetic implants on the back of his head, so maybe this is Lobot. Then we see the fifth brother leading a squad of stormtroopers through the streets of Dayu. The Arabesh letters here aren't really anything impressive, just things like market and food. Then we see a couple of escape pods, making me wonder if these are other runaway Jedi evading the Empire as they board their ship. Now, at this point in history, History, there are still several Jedi running loose around the galaxy, so it's very possible that some of them are trying to reform the Order. This is what Sarah Junda was doing in Fallen Order and Jocasta New in the Darth Vader comics. Next, we see that someone has written the Jedi symbol in a kind of hobo code. Now, this could be a way to tell Jedi that this is a safe house, or maybe it's simply a marker to remind people that the Jedi are still alive, that the light has not died out. This reminds me an awful lot of the Mandalorian culvert that we saw in the Book of Boba Fett, which were marked by hidden symbols that could only be read through a man Mandalorian's helmet. Now here, it looks like a shot damages this roof, sending out a flock of birds. These look an awful lot like the Convors. That's the bird species of Morai, who is, I guess you could say, like Ahsoka's spirit animal. And the final text of the trailer, Hope Survives, is referring to a new hope himself, Lucas Skywalker, the young boy that Obi-Wan is tasked to protect. The trailer ends with this sound. Because yes, the show is going to bring back Darth Vader, and I'm thrilled that he's not actually in the trailer, yet. So I have not read any plot leaks or rumors or spoilers, so I just wanna offer up a few theories about what I think is going to happen in this show. For instance, who is Obi-Wan talking to here? We lost. Huggy Baby on Twitter suggested this could be the force ghost of Qui-Gon Jinn urging Obi-Wan to continue the fight against the Sith, maybe. After all, Revenge of the Sith does end with Yoda promising Obi-Wan how to get in touch with his old master. How to commune with him, I will teach you. Now I do think that Liam Neeson is going to appear in this show somehow, but I think Obi-Wan is probably talking to another member of the Jedi Order, maybe even a former Padawan who wants to get the band back together and fight the Empire. Now, could this be the Jedi cell that Cal Kestis joins in Jedi Fallen Order? Maybe, but I think they're more than likely going to leave his story to the games. My theory is that, like I said, Obi-Wan accidentally tips off the Imperials that there's a Jedi on Tatooine. Or, or like maybe Jar Jar sees him in the street and shouts, Obi, my old friend Jedi, oh, there's a Jedi friend of mine, really loud and it gets everybody's attention or something. So now that the heat is on Obi-Wan, he has to get off world because the longer he's here, the more likely it is that the Inquisitors will sense Luke Skywalker, Vader's son. The Emperor knew as I did. If Anakin were to have any offspring, they would be a threat to him. 
So he decides to end this by finding and killing Darth Vader once and for all, or to find some other way to get the Inquisitors off his back. Maybe he even tries to rescue a Jedi prisoner, and this is what brings him into conflict with Vader, which gives this line new context. A tremor in the Force. The last time I felt it, was in the presence of my old master. But what do you think about all this? What are your theories on what's going to happen? What do you think of the trailer? Let me know in the comments below or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe and smash that bell. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.